This is Tom Kozik, the head of public policy and municipal strategy at Hilltop Securities. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this episode of our Hilltop Talks Politics and Finance podcast series for 2024. This is the first episode for the new year. Thanks, everyone, for the encouragement to get back at the podcast series at the end of last year and to, 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 to get back into it also at the beginning of this year for 2024. These Hilltop Talks discussions with subject matter experts, we consider topics that intersect the areas of politics and finance at the federal, state, and local levels in the U.S. We often concentrate on issues related to the U.S. public finance and the U.S. municipal bond market. Today, we're going to review the Hilltop Securities 2024 municipal bond market sector outlooks. Uh, The analysts at Hilltop Securities published a 20 or so page report on Monday, January 22nd, titled The Municipal Market in 2024, Hilltop's Municipal Sector Credit Outlooks. And the report is available online at the Hilltop Insights section of the Hilltop Securities website. I want to note that this report was a collaboration between myself, Yaffa Ratner, Doug Nelson, Ted Chapman, and Phil Villaluz. And today, we have Phil Villaluz, who is a, a municipal credit analyst who works with the Hilltop Fixed Income Capital Markets Group, Uh, with us, and Phil and I are going to discuss some of the big picture and sector-specific themes that came out of the 2024 Sector Outlook piece. Thanks very much for joining the podcast today, Phil. We are very happy to have you. Hi, Tom. I appreciate you having me on today. So Phil has extensive experience as a municipal credit analyst on both the buy side and the sell side. And working in both of those capacities really gives him a perspective that not many credit analysts possess. So I find that his opinion is very, very valuable. So, Phil, what I was thinking about is that we would start off by you asking me some questions about kind of the big picture and macroeconomic backdrop, and then maybe some questions about the the tax back sectors. And then I thought that I'd ask you some questions uh, about the revenue sectors. Yeah, sure thing. That sounds like a plan, Tom. All right. Uh, the the Hilltop Munip- Municipal Analyst Team published the firm's Municipal Sector Outlooks uh, recently. What are the major themes that you're following for 2024? Yeah, I'd say that one of the w- one of the most important themes. Now that we're at the end of January, going into February of 2024, one of the most important themes is a theme that I wasn't really latching on to even in December. And that's, that is the macroeconomic backdrop and the fact that the macroeconomic backdrop is going to be much better going into 2024 than most expected. Going back to the end of 2022, I'm thinking about this. There was an article about a uh, a Bloomberg model that was projecting a 100% chance of recession by the end of 2023. Uh, the economic, uh, the GDP economic growth numbers for the U.S. came out uh, this week. They were stronger for the fourth quarter than the economy than most economists expected. It seems as though a soft landing, not only a soft landing, is in the cards, uh, but It seems as though the macroeconomic picture and the U.S. economy is going to be even more resilient going into 2024 than most expected. And so I think that that is a very important theme for municipal credit. It means that uh, there's not going to be either a slowdown and or a uh, recession in the cards for 2024. And so that's going to be good for uh, tax revenues. It's going to be good for the revenues uh, in the, uh, in the sectors like airports, higher ed. Um, And so I think from a big picture perspective, that is one of the major stories. Uh, The other big picture theme that I think is important is the fact that, and I'm going back to one of the things that we wrote in the beginning of 2021, in the beginning of 2021, uh, there was a significant, you know, 600 billion plus of federal fiscal policy that was going directly to public finance sectors. Uh, we described that as a temporary upswing of credit, uh, and I've been describing that also as the, a, a golden age of public finance. I think that now 
I don't think that the golden age is ended, but I think that we're on the down swing. Uh, we're on the the other side of that. And I think that uh, this, and I think that what that means for credit on the tax back side, on the revenue side, is that credit quality is going to be normalizing, you know, over the next budget cycle two or three. Yeah, that, that is very interesting. Now, was there a common thread, you know, uh, related, let's say, sector by sector for the 2024 outlooks? Yeah, I think that that normalizing theme is one that is, I think that it's being, uh, I, I think that it's impacting the sectors in different ways, but I think that that normalizing theme is common across all of the sectors. Uh, I think that it's, and I think that it's, and I think that one of the other things that's going to be, uh, that's going to play across all of the sectors as well is that normalizing process is going to occur, you know, over several budget cycles. It's not going to be, it's not going to play out over just one year. Uh, one of the other common themes I think is that it's very important to look at the specific metrics and specific credit fundamentals, not just by sector, but QCIP by QCIP. One of the things that I've been that I've been talking to investors about is going through portfolios and looking at holdings on a QCIP by QCIP basis, because even in situations where uh, you know we have pretty, we think that credit is going to continue to be strong on the tax back side, <clears throat> but there are still some, and there are some uh, tax backed credits that are even being upgraded and, or the uh, outlooks are being raised now, but I'm less convinced that there are, that all of those tax backed credits or all of those tax backs, um, QCIPs are going to maintain structural balance in the next budget cycle or two or three, right? So I think it's very, very important that uh, investors look through their portfolios on a QCIP by QCIP basis. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. You, you really can't, you know, uh, you know paint, you know, the, that sector with a, with a broad uh, brush. Now, Tom, we lowered the credit outlooks on the U.S. local government sector and the U.S. K through 12 school district sectors to stable from positive for 2024. Can you tell us why? Yeah, I think that that, uh, that has a lot to do with this, uh, this normalization that is going on. Uh, we we did something similar with the state sector last year. Uh, a, after the 2021 fiscal policy, we raised the outlooks on the state, local, and K through 12 sectors to positive from stable because of that substantial amount of uh, money that we just were talking about that went to. Um, entities in all three of those sectors. Uh, we saw, it, it just seemed like that normalization process was starting at the state level sooner. And so we lowered uh, this, the outlook on the state sector to stable from positive in the 2023 outlooks. So this year uh, we started to see that normalization process really uh, begin at the local level in K through 12. Now, lowering that outlook to stable from positive doesn't necessarily mean that we're expecting credit deterioration in those sectors. Uh, we actually are continuing to expect that public finance upgrades are going to continue to outpace downgrades. Uh, they have outpaced downgrades over the last couple of years. We're expecting that to continue uh, this year as well, uh, but we're expecting that pace to slow, right? So again, that's going to be reflective of this normalization process, and it's something that um, we want to make sure that you know, folks. I mean, it's been several years now, 
And I think that one of the things that not a lot of folks really either uh, realize or remember is that there were portions of both the state, local government, and K through 12 sectors that were uh, the credit was deteriorating, even, you know, before before COVID. Uh, part of that was still a function of um, the uh, the budget cuts that they had to make in the wake of the Great Recession. Uh, there was uh, expenditure demand was really outpacing uh, the pace that revenues were were able to um, rise. And I think that there is a little more room coming out of the uh, the COVID situation, that w- and it was especially helped by that fiscal policy. Um, but that's also kind of what takes us back to when you're one of those other c- common credit-related themes that we were just talking about, is I think that in order to differentiate between you know the credits that are going to maintain structural balance over the next budget cycle, two or three, I think it's important that investors really do dig into the individual credit metrics and individual numbers for uh, specific QCIPs. So um, I, what I'd like to do now, Phil, if uh, it works, is to ask you some questions about the, the revenue sectors. Um, I'm wondering, in general, what your view on those revenue sectors are uh, going into 2024. Sure, Tom. Uh, let me start by saying that we still see tremendous long-term investment value in munis. That said, muni credits are highly fragmented, especially across revenue sectors. So I think it's important to be able to identify not only the macro trends impacting each sector, but also to distinguish between the stronger and weaker credits within those those subsectors. Generally, in this environment of normalization that we talked about, credit quality appears to favor larger names, those with deeper balance sheets, healthy debt service coverage metrics, greater financial flexibility, or durable revenue streams. Are there sectors that you feel more strongly about compared to others? I'm wondering, uh, are you still bullish on the toll road sector, for example? Yes, uh, absolutely. You know, looking at U.S. toll facilities, in fact, toll road issuers have been one of my favorite rebound plays over the past couple of years. We continue to observe that financial metrics such as traffic and revenue numbers and debt service coverage ratios have been on this strong improving trend uh, from the pandemic lows and should remain sound in 2024. Uh, Numerous large toll road issuers have built up a war chest of, of cash that provide a very deep level of financial flexibility, which I might also expect would likely be used to fund ongoing capital projects. Um, you know, consequence of that would be reducing the need for incremental new debt. Uh, another important point, many toll roads have inflation-linked toll-raising policies which enables them to maintain its very healthy uh, operating margin and solid debt coverage level. Uh, Also, we saw traffic volume as measured by BMT or vehicle miles traveled quickly recover from pandemic loads and illustrates the durability of demand for highway driving. You know, what's interesting, Tom, from the perspective of hybrid work, you know, it seems that commuting habits, at least for uh, a lot of workers in, in urban areas and where, where I am in the in New York City metropolitan area, have shifted from mass transit to the convenience of the flexibility of driving yourself. You know, in addition to that, right. full road systems you know, tend to be used by uh, a higher volume 
of commercial and truck traffic, you know, and, and it benefited the uh, from the increase in demand for delivery of goods and supplies. Uh, just by nature, uh, tractor trailers and uh, commercial trucks tend to pay the, the highest rate on these uh, on these toll roads. Uh, I, I would caveat by saying, you know, tempering our stable outlook, our expectations for uh, a bit of slowing in commercial traffic growth on any economic uh, or softness in economic conditions that we may experience later this year. So the airport sector is one I remember getting all kinds of questions about at the beginning of COVID uh, because they're just, you know, the employment activity just plummeted. Uh, I'm wondering what your opinion is of the airport sector uh, now and what's happening with employments. Yeah, that's that's a great question, Tom. You know, we, we do continue to have a stable outlook on the airport sector, but you know, talk about coming back from the depths of the pandemic. By last September, passenger employments had fully recovered, and in some or many individual cases, airports even surpassed 2019 pre-pandemic levels. So Mm -hmm. as a result of this rebound, a lot of airports, a lot of the major O&D airports uh, have returned to a more, uh, call it normalized, rate setting, flexibility, and revenue metric, which has a lot to do with the rate agreements uh, between airports and airlines that are renegotiated roughly every five years or so. Uh, We expect both sides will be able to make the necessary adjustments over the near term. In addition, Airport finances and liquidity levels have recently benefited from a significant amount of federal aid that that flowed into those, uh, you know, those airports and uh, airport names uh, uh, through the, the pandemic. But many of the large airport operators uh, have begun using those cash reserves rather than you know going to the uh, debt markets with more you know cost uh, costly uh, uh, borrowing or, or debt issuance to help fund mm-hmm. those capital spending and improvement projects you know in my opinion the the amount of investment that an airport makes in terms of modernization and improvement is is very, very important when it comes to competing you know, for those, those travelers. And, and that landscape just continues to be more competitive year after year. I mean, who wouldn't want to fly in and out of uh, a shiny new airport? Um, right. Although some things uh, we want to keep an eye on this year uh, include continued airport and airline labor and capacity constraints. Yeah, that's that's similar to uh, you know, uh, the, the environment that that we saw in uh, 2022 and uh, the first part of uh, uh, last year uh, with uh, uh, labor shortages, uh, um, if, uh, uh, equipment and, and full flights. That could be uh, something that uh, affects uh, travel levels uh, this year. You know, combining that, and this is similar to what we're watching on the toll road front, is also the uh, anticipated softening U.S. economy could moderate the demand for air travel as both leisure and business travelers cut back on spending. Right. So one of the areas that one of the revenue sectors that we made a change to our outlook uh, was private higher education. Could you talk about the change that we made and why it is that we made that change? 
Yes, of course. Uh, we raised our sector outlook for private higher education to cautious from negative, while our sector outlooks for both public and private higher education are cautious. We do want to reinforce to investors that credit selection is key to navigating both of these subsectors, which are really differentiated, as you've mentioned earlier, by the haves and have nots. To be clear, enrollment and demand measures will continue to be leading factors to consider as the level of competition from colleges and universities for a continually shrinking pool of students continues to intensify, both due to a combination of shifting consumer preferences, overcapacity, and the impending demographic cliff. That's where the number of high school graduates is projected to significantly decline after 2025. Now, on the financial side, balancing rising operating costs and capital spending needs will continue to pressure school budgets in 2024. This pressure poses greater challenges for those schools with less financial resources as uh, the pandemic funds are exhausted and you know, states begin to face the possibility of slower economic growth public universities could also experience deeper and more meaningful cuts uh, to state aid revenues, which they've been accustomed to getting. Now, favorable investment gains uh, during uh, fiscal 2023 may, however, allow certain private schools with deeper endowments or reserves to maintain balance sheet flexibility despite cash uh, the uh, weaker cash flows. Uh, nonetheless, we think larger or wealthier institutions with diverse revenue streams, strong brand recognition, and student demand will fare better and maintain credit quality compared to smaller, less selective schools who are struggling with weak finances and declining enrollment. Yeah, thanks very much, Phil. I appreciate you for for joining us today and talking about those uh, revenue sectors is very important. I want to thank everybody who tuned in and downloaded our recording today. Uh, thanks very much for listening. For those interested, you can also see uh, the other Hilltop Securities Economic and Municipal Commentary and listen to our podcasts by going to hilltopsecurities.com backslash commentary. And you can follow me uh, on Twitter and LinkedIn. You can also uh, follow uh, Hilltop Securities on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, thanks again, everyone. We look forward to bringing you more color in the future related to topics that intersect the world of politics, finance, and public finance. This has been Tom Koslick and Phil Villaluz from Hilltop Securities.